Welcome back to This Week in Immigration, the Bipartisan Policy Center's podcast for immigration nerds. I'm Hannah Tyler, research analyst for BPC's Immigration Project, still filling in for Blake Johnson, who is out on parental leave. Given the recent events in Europe, in this week's episode, we're talking about the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on migration and refugees. Teresa Cardinal-Brown, BPC's Managing Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy, will be joined by Chris Ramon, Global and U.S. Immigration Policy Researcher and Analyst, to discuss the ways in which Europe is responding to the arrival of many refugees from Ukraine. Chris was previously the Immigration Project Senior Policy Analyst and has worked with the Migration Policy Institute, the Episcopal Church, the Bush Center, and the National Immigration Forum. Also joining is Krish Omara Vignaraja, president of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, to talk about the impact that this might have on the U.S. refugee resettlement system and what policy avenues the United States has available to assist Ukrainians in the United States and those displaced because of this military action. Krish previously served in the Obama White House as policy director for First Lady Michelle Obama and at the State Department as senior advisor under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Secretary of State John Kerry. Stay tuned. Welcome back. As Hannah noted, our guests today have unique perspectives to share on the humanitarian refugee crisis that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has created. Longtime listeners of the podcast will remember Chris Ramon, a regular voice on This Week in Immigration, when he was a senior policy analyst for the Bipartisan Policy Center. He's now an independent researcher and an analyst, but well-versed in comparative U.S. and European migration as a former Fulbright scholar in Spain. So welcome back, Chris. It is fantastic to uh, be on this podcast and uh, brings back a lot of warm memories. Great. Well, we're really happy to have you. Um, We're also thrilled to have a friend of the BPC and president of the Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services, LIRS, Krish Amara Vignaraja, who is joining us. Uh, LIRS is one of the national refugee resettlement organizations in the United States and also an advocate for immigrants and refugees. So welcome, Krish. Thank you for having me. So, Chris, uh, I'm going to start with you. Um, We have all been seeing in images of the media over the last week, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has already displaced hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and other nationals in what the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, has called the largest refugee displacement in Europe since World War II. Uh, Many of us saw how Europe reacted to the migrants arriving from Syria and North Africa in 2015 and 2016, and yet it seems this time is different as many countries along the Ukrainian border are opening themselves to the refugees. So Chris, let me ask you, first of all, what effect will the Russian invasion of Ukraine have on migration in Europe generally? So I think we're just going to be seeing a lot more Uh, individuals who are going to be coming through the eastern part of the European Union and, you know, the European continent in general. Uh, You know, I think what we've been seeing up until this point is, you know, immigrants coming from different parts of the world, a lot of them seeking protection um, from Africa, the Middle East, um, some places even as far as Afghanistan. Um, But and they've been coming to uh, Europe over the last couple of years. Obviously, the key event was the Uh, European uh, migration event that happened around 2015 through 2018, 2019. Um, But, you know, that that flow of individuals who were initially coming through the land border, through Turkey, and then into the Balkans, into the EU, um, or now more of them are coming from North Africa and are taking a pretty treacherous journey through the Mediterranean to try to reach the EU's borders. That's what we've been seeing. But now we're about to see uh, a new source of migration of individuals who are coming from Ukraine, who are going to be entering through countries such as Poland, Romania. Uh, you also see Moldova, which is not part of the European Union, but it is sort of one of those countries that's emerging as a key receiver of migrants. So it's going to be adding uh, more individuals who are coming to the to to the EU seeking protection on top of already a large number of individuals ha- who have been trying to get protection uh, for a while. So it's it, it's going to present. Um, some new challenges, not to say that they're insurmountable and not even to say that the EU doesn't have the tools to handle with them, but it is going to be a challenge um, when you're dealing with just the scope of uh, the number of individuals who are fleeing. Um, probably, I think by the time this podcast gets um, you know, published, we, we probably will be looking somewhere in the ballpark of a million people who have, have already left um, you know, uh, Ukraine. I mean, we're, I think we're right now we're close to 800 to 900,000 individuals. Um, so 
it, it, that gives you the scope that this is going to be significant. But I think that the, the key thing is not to see this as sort of an existential threat to Europe, which I think is one of the problematic responses that we've seen in the past. The immigration is a threat to the, to the country. It can be handled well, it can be managed humanely, and we can provide protection for these folks and other folks who are coming to Europe as well. Yeah. And and just to give comparison to the scope here, we mentioned possibly at least a million immigrants within the span of a week and a half since this all started have arrived to uh, have left Ukraine. The entire encounters at the U.S.-Mexico border last year were just uh, over a million. So and we had that over the ser- over the series of a year. So just, you know, for comparison's sake. But Chris, um, you mentioned that Europe has the tools to manage this. What has Europe done to prepare for the potential influx of these Ukrainian refugees? And and how have governments in the vicinity responded? So it's interesting because the response had, you know, kind of harkens back to a policy that uh, was was adopted in the year 2001. But I'm going to talk more about what they've been what they've done uh, since the European migration event um, from the last decade and, and then talking about this older policy. So after that, that event, um, you know, the EU did start investing a lot in sort of plans to be able to sort of anticipate and manage migration. They, they basically came up with um, a plan to sort of have an early warning system when you start seeing the emergence of potential migration events. And then are, you know, it, then they basically focus on sort of managing this. So it, basically, the, the, the name of this policy is the blueprint mechanism. And so it's there to sort of anticipate and manage, uh, you know, large scale migration events. And that's sort of the, the, the purpose. And, you know, I, I do think that's actually my own thoughts are it is a smart way of thinking about of anticipating these things and then surging resources where needed to be able to manage this. Um, but at the same time, it is worth noting that also at the member state level, you have seen a greater uh, emphasis on deterrence at the border, um, you know, you know, one of the things that we saw earlier this year was the arrival arrivals of migrants through Belarus into the Polish border um, that, you know, the Belarusian government was kind of, you know, weaponizing, to be fr- frank. Um, and you saw Poland start setting up uh, border infrastructure to prevent individuals from coming in. That's just one example. We've seen other countries such as Hungary doing this or Greece um, in different ways, shape or form. So it's interesting that the EU is sort of thinking how can we manage these things better? But at the member state level, there is a has been an emphasis on deterrence. Now, what's interesting is that the response that we've been seeing from the EU also touches on two things. One is that uh, Ukrainian nationals do have visa free travel in the EU um, and can remain in the EU for 90 days. So that's one of the ways that these folks are being able to come in. But the European Union is also looking to actually start implementing uh, another policy, which was called the Temporary Protection Directive, which was adopted in 2001 after you saw the large number of, of refugees coming in from the, the wars in, in, in the Balkans and the former Yugoslavia. And that basically is able to provide fast track protection that's temporary for three years, allows individuals to stay in the country, be able to work. And so this is now um, being enacted by the EU. The steps to, um, to invoke it are being adopted right now to be able to provide sort of this temporary protection. So, um, you know, there there is a response, I think that's more proactive and less deterrence focused. I think the long term questions, though, is whether this, you know, warm welcome we're seeing is actually going to last uh, if this if the war continues for an extended period of time. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that some of the countries that had maybe some of the hardest line against the uh, Syrian, Middle Eastern and North African refugees are being very welcoming of the Ukrainians, including Hungary and and Poland, you know, but also you also mentioned that the EU is prepping this sort of temporary protection. Do you think that's a distinction right now is that they see that the Ukrainian refugees may be just temporary versus the uh, Middle Eastern and North African refugees were looking for permanent resettlement in the in the EU? I would say so. Yes, I think I think right now the assumption is that if this is a short term event, uh, then you know that lasts somewhere in the ballpark of that temporary protection period that you see from the directive. Um, I could see that these countries would be willing to do that. Um, you know, the question is, is that actually going to happen, right? And and that's what it comes down to is that if this starts dragging out how warm of that welcome will, will stay. And, and I think that there are sort of precedents when you look at other parts of the world um, 
you know, where if that, that may not be the case, that there was a warm welcome, but then things got a little bit uneven. Um, I'm thinking specifically around the Venezuelan uh, refugee crisis, where you saw South American countries, such as Colombia, doing some really great policies in receiving an integration that are, I think, are really groundbreaking. I mean, absolutely impressive. And, the, and you saw the whole that whole region kind of coming in together to be able to assist with this. But as this crisis has continued, you have seen uh, some other countries, I'm thinking, uh, for instance, like Peru, um, that have taken a much harder line over time to prevent migrants from coming in there. And so this sort of uneven welcome starts emerging across South America with this. So obviously it's not a direct one-to-one comparison, but that I think highlights the fact that if there's a sense that this is going to become permanent, uh, you might see governments and their populations start turning against this. We're already seeing this, like you noted, with populations that are seeking protection in Europe who are coming from the Middle East, North, uh, North Africa, Africa, and other parts of the world who are seeking you know, permanent protection. And you have seen them definitely turn towards a much harder line position on this. But the, the, So the question is, at what point will that warm welcome last for Ukrainians? I mean, there's there's a, there's other nationalities that were, you know, people of other nationalities that were living in Ukraine. Um, one of the things we're hearing and seeing now is African students who were in Ukraine who are trying to now reach Europe and not being allowed in. Afghan refugees that had been initially uh, brought to Ukraine who are now trying to get uh, on into Europe um, and not necessarily being allowed in. Um, d- you know, do you see that uh, being addressed uh, by the EU soon uh, to, to balance that out? I mean, they're all fleeing the same conditions. Absolutely. And I think the fact that this is now getting commented on by, um, I believe, UNHCR has come out with a statement to this effect. Um, I think you are seeing significant blowback um, that there is going to be an emphasis ensuring that you know all vulnerable individuals who are leaving Ukraine, all of them, um, can should and be able to access that protection and be able to leave the country. Um, but I think that this does speak to sort of this very you know this double standard that you know you know one population is receiving a warmer welcome than the other one, and I think that's reflective of sort of this broader trend of the EU just being very different and wary, if not, you know, bluntly at times outright hostile to individuals who are coming from other parts of the world in comparison to folks from Ukraine. The United States has, I know, sent troop troops and humanitarian aid to the countries in Europe that are receiving the Ukrainian refugees, as, um, as well as what we're sending to Ukraine itself. What more do you think the United States could do at this time to help Europe receive refugees? I think the key question is, um, you know, the State Department's uh, Bureau of Population, Refugee and Migration, which does a lot of the coordinating with international organizations such as the IOM, UNHCR, but also with the EU on migration issues. The question really is, how can that high level dialogue between the European Union and the United States through the State Department really identify what the EU needs in terms of assistance from the United States? Um, You know, it's interesting because last year, you know, there were, there were a couple of meetings in the EU with the administration, and one of the issues that did come up was immigration and future EU-US coordination on these issues. So I think that this is an opportunity for at least for like you know, thinking through policy responses. Um, that could be one potential channel, but in terms of resources, and I think uh, Chris can definitely speak to this a little bit more than uh, uh, you know on this is is really is how can you ensure that the EU has the capacity and the resources to be able to receive ind- individuals long term. Um, and like I said, individuals, you know, who are in Ukraine, all Ukraine, uh, you know, Ukraine or non Ukrainian, all individuals in vulnerable positions that can receive that protection. Um, and I think part of the, that, you know, calculus is also ensuring that the EU has the resources to be able to provide protection to other populations that are showing up at the same time. Because like I said, this is sort of one of these issues where people have been seeking protection in Europe and will continue to do so. So it's ensuring that everybody has the ability to receive this protection. Um, But I think that a lot of it, the first step really has to be coordination and understanding of what the EU's needs are and how the the, the Biden administration can come in and, and address those. But I think over the longer term, as if this continues to drag out, um, it's going to have to be the United States stepping up and also taking uh, folks in and providing them with protection because um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there's going to have to be some sort of level of global solidarity with protecting these folks. Um, and I think the United States needs to do more on that.
Yeah. Well, this is, as you mentioned, now it's a perfect time to bring Chris in. So Chris, let me turn to you. Do do we expect uh, many Ukrainian refugees to come to the United States from Europe or, or from Ukraine? What are we hearing about that? Yeah. So in the immediate term, uh, we aren't necessarily expecting a significant influx of Ukrainian refugees to come to the U.S. We know that Europe will bear the brunt of this crisis, given these nations' geographic and cultural proximity um, to Ukraine. But with that said, we should still expect to welcome some Ukrainians as time goes on. Um, Already over the past 10 years, the U.S. has welcomed just shy of 20,000 Ukrainian refugees. Uh, We've helped to resettle many of these families. And on a daily basis, our staff have been inundated with calls from them, desperately seeking information on how they can sponsor their families to come to the U.S., So there will certainly be a demand for it. Um, But as you know, the traditional refugee resettlement system isn't um, as agile as I think many of us would like to see. It can take years, if not a decade or more, to obtain refugee status and ultimately resettle in the U.S. So it isn't that system that, you know, kind of is is, is prepared um, and able to evacuate in the kind of crisis situation we're seeing. So what are the U.S. government's policy options for assisting Ukrainians who are seeking protection right now? Um, You you mentioned that previous uh, Ukrainian refugees already in the United States may have family members. Could they sponsor them to come to the United States? But what are the other options available? Yeah, so so there are a few different options um, in terms of what the U.S. government can be doing, um, as well as, you know, Americans. I think the first and most pressing um, is to work with the international community to surge humanitarian assistance to displaced people in the region, as Chris mentioned. Um, There is an immediate need for food, uh, clean drinking water, um, shelter, medical care, um, and and much, much more. I think part of what you're seeing is uh, there is a understandable desire to get people processed and across the border as quickly as possible. Um, Many are going to city centers, but what that means is that there is sort of a deferral in terms of what is actually the long-term trajectory, um, kind of what are the next steps for these individuals. Uh, We've seen an initial commitment from the State Department to provide uh, $54 million in humanitarian assistance, but the need is only going to grow. In fact, just yesterday, the UN launched an emergency appeal for $1.7 billion in humanitarian assistance, so there is a very long way to go. Um, Beyond funding, There is also a need for operational personnel to assist with refugee processing and accommodation. Um, And we've seen a first step from the U.S. in terms of the deployment of uh, roughly 5,000 U.S. troops to Poland. Um, And many of those are supporting um, kind of the the logistical operations and standing up um, that additional kind of reception center capacity. Um, But as the situation continues to deteriorate, we may need to consider deploying additional personnel and resources. Yeah. Um, you know, we we heard a, a lot of warnings from resettlement agencies when Afghan reg- refugees began leaving Afghanistan. That the United States resettlement infrastructure was not equipped to handle the influx of people. Ha- have we made any progress in rebuilding that infrastructure since then? And and where does it stand today if we're potentially looking at, you know, a- another group of folks coming uh, in the not too distant future? Well, I wish uh, that it wasn't on the backs of, of staff um, and volunteers who have been working literally 24-7, but I am pleased to report that we are indeed making quite a lot of progress in rebuilding the resettlement infrastructure. Um, it's worth noting just how decimated the infrastructure was as a result of the prior um, Trump administration. You know, more than a third of local resettlement offices, meaning about 100 offices nationwide, were forced to shut down or suspend services. Um, We at LIRS had about 17 of our offices closed at that time. Um, And so in many ways, the Afghan resettlement mission fast-tracked the rebuilding effort. So just to give you an example, um, we at LIRS have been able to launch or reactivate 14 sites over uh, the past year, um, less than a year. Um, At our headquarters, we've gone from about 80 staff to more than 260. And we've been able to scale up staffing across our network of local affiliates. Now, only a piece of this is because of refugee resettlement, but I do think it reflects um, rebuilding the capacity that we need 
um, in this work of welcome. There are still challenges with bandwidth and capacity because it is highly atypical to welcome 76,000 people over a six month period. Um, that hasn't been done on this scale in that time frame since the end of the second, um, since the end of the Vietnam War. But we are certainly making a lot of headway and we need to make sure that this capacity we've rebuilt doesn't go to waste. And that's where it could be repurposed to welcome refugees from all over the world, including Ukraine. So what about domestic U.S. policy um, and action to respond to the crisis? Um, there's been cl- calls, uh, including to be for for transparency's sake, the Bipartisan Policy Center has called for temporary protected status for Ukrainians in the United States. Now, this is I think our equivalent of the temporary protection directive that, that Chris was talking about in the EU, but basically for Ukrainians who are already present in the United States who might be in danger of losing status or are in danger of deportation. Obviously, uh, de- deporting people back to Ukraine right now is probably not feasible. Um, you know, that's one option on the table. What other policy options are available to the U.S. government right now? Yeah, Teresa, it's a great question because I do think that just as we have shown um, kind of a return to the global stage and the role that we play as leader of the free world. We are still very much uh, the humanitarian leader of the world. And we shouldn't take a backseat when so many of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are fleeing violence and oppression at the hands of an authoritarian strongman. Um, So as Chris mentioned, it is heartening to see um, the temporary protection um, that is being afforded to Ukrainian refugees. We've been heartened to see The White House asked for $2.9 billion in humanitarian aid um, for Ukraine. And we have put out a call to our supporters to urge their elected officials to make that a reality. Um, You know, so if if you want to send a message to your representative, you can actually go to our um, website at lirs.org and you'll see our Ukraine Action Center um, on our homepage. Uh, We also do need to see the U.S. Strengthened Consular Services throughout the region. Um, We've been hearing reports of extremely long lines at the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw. Um, We expect that trend at other embassies and consulates elsewhere. So we need to make sure that we have the resources and personnel in place to process visa requests in a timely fashion. And of course, there are a number of Ukrainian immigrants here. um, And and, that's where the temporary protected status is going to be so critical. Um, We know that we cannot be returning people um, to a war zone. Um, and that's where the administration needs to use every tool at its disposable at, at its disposal to make sure they aren't forced back to an active war zone. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's right there in the statute that that you know, uh, civil unrest and war is one of the criteria that that can be make a country eligible for TPS. So it seems, uh, at least on a on a legal basis, a, a no brainer. What about that other thing we heard a lot around uh, the Afghan evacuation, humanitarian parole? Is is that an option that can be used? Um, you know, it's it's not clear that the Afghans are applying for visas right now would qualify for visas. So is that another option that we could use? Uh, I, I will just point out that our colleague David Beer over at Cato today tweeted out a, what I think is a brilliant idea of using the ESTA system, which is an electronic system for travel authorization that's usually used for visa waiver people to sort of pre-screen Ukrainians who wouldn't come to the United States. Um, I don't know what you think about that. I just threw that out there. But, uh, you know, what are the are those some of the the maybe creative ideas that we could use to help Ukrainians who might be trying to reunite with family in the United States or have other ties here that would that would make it reasonable for them to come here? I mean, I think we've got to be as creative as we can, knowing that uh, we are not the front lines in the way that Moldova and Hungary and Poland are. And so to the extent that we can bear um, some significant part of uh, the response, um, I think it's worth considering. Candidly, I'm a a bit doubtful in terms of whether we would see humanitarian parole used um, at the scale that we saw with the Afghan evacuees. Um, But it is a tool that is used on a case-by-case basis. Um, So we are strongly urging um, the Department of Homeland Security to exercise the very broad discretion that it has. And there are many Americans with close ties to displaced Ukrainians, um, where I think we should be applying that uh, authority generously. Let's talk about the refugee process. I mean, you mentioned it's not a quick process. Um, What are our capacities for um, 
refugee resettlement maybe in the in the future, if not immediately from that region. Um, you know, w- with the designation, I think this year we this fiscal year, the president said we'd like to welcome 125,000 refugees from all around the world. But what were the designations for that part of the world? And is that um, you know what's needed to actually make that work? Yeah. So. It is helpful that President Biden fulfilled his campaign pledge in increasing the presidential determination to 125,000. Um, the one complication here is that um, kind of U- Europe has basically a regional allocation of 10,000. So it would be valuable to lift that um, uh, you know, allocation. Um, it is a determination that you know the administration makes. So it is something that is easy to uh, uh, kind of unwind um, or, or reallocate. Um, I am confident that any new arrivals uh, won't have an impact on the resettlement of Afghans. And so I think there is an opportunity for us knowing that the system has hit rock bottom. We are not anywhere close to that cap. And so if we uh, take advantage of the domestic capacity that we built, um, there is an opportunity. But I think it's important to stress that Using the domestic capacity that we've rebuilt requires us to build the overseas pipeline. And that is a concern of mine. You know, I've raised this for many months where as the resettlement agencies, we don't have control over that, right? That is where the State Department has been nimble and creative um, and industrious in terms of how uh, we work to resettle Afghans. I hope that we are also as creative and innovative when it comes to what role um, we could do to build that capacity in in Ukraine. Um, you know, I know that there is a um, a, re- a refugee support um, center in RSC in in Moldova um, that was a, a kind of shifted, but but it, it it's not as big as we need at this at this moment. And so that's where um, the State Department really has to step up because this is something that needed to happen not just yesterday, but a few days ago. Um, So let me ask the question that I think a lot of our listeners are going to ask. How can Americans help? Um, You know, we talked about what the governments can do. We talked about what agencies can do. How can how can Americans who want to help help? What's the best way for them to get engaged? Yeah. And and I've just got to say that it is so inspiring um, to get that question, because I do think it's the question that people are asking. Right. It's the question that we saw Americans asking when it came to the Afghans. And the fact that Americans are not tapped out after the last several months and are willing to respond whenever there is a global need, to me speaks volumes about who we are as a nation and what we are willing to do to help. Um, As individuals, I think that uh, we are limited in the sense that we're obviously, you know, this is not at our border. Um, But I do think it's valuable recognizing that so many international entities like UNHCR um, have made pleas for support. Um, There's obviously some wonderful local Ukrainian aid organizations as well. Um, I think what I would stress is, uh, as as individuals, please do your due diligence. Um, You know, we are standing up a resource at um, www.lirs.org slash Ukraine, where we're doing some of that vetting just because if it's an entity that just got stood up in the last couple of days, we can't vouch for that, right? Um, but I know that there are so many uh, wonderful organizations, Red Cross, Save the Children, who are doing incredible work. And so we do need to support those efforts. Um, but as I said, individuals and the and the kind of private sector can do um, some amount, but we need to understand that our governments need to act. And this is where Americans need to make sure that our political leaders hear that this is an issue we care about, that this is a part of being a welcoming nation, about um, protecting democracy and freedom. And so I think that that's where, um, you know, it's about the power of the purse, but it's also about the power of your voice. Yeah. So Congress is right now considering not only the budget for fiscal year 2022, but uh, another supplemental, as you mentioned, the Biden administration asked for additional uh, supplemental funding. So um, that's something that we can encourage uh, Congress to support. Um, I would just note, uh, because a lot of people don't know this, even though the UN uh, is supported by governmental funding, uh, UNHCR, 
in particular, does accept private donations. And there are ways that individuals who seek to support them in their international efforts um, can contribute. So um, we will try to put links to um, their website in our show notes for this podcast. I want to thank you both very, very much um, for your perspective and your expertise on this. Obviously, this is something that has happened fairly quickly and uh, captured a lot of Americans' attention. I'm very happy that we were able to break some, down some of the, the issues here today, and I expect that we will be talking about this again. So I hope that we, you will both be willing to come back at some future time. Thank you so much. Thank you. So just because we like to plug our folks, um, you can follow Chris, R- Chris Ramon on Twitter at C Ramon Migration, and you can follow Krish at Krish Vignaraja. Also, Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services, as she mentioned a few times, is at L-I-R-S dot O-R-G. Thank you both for joining us on This Week in Immigration. And that's it for our show this week. One last reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. I'm Hannah Tyler. This Week in Immigration was created and executive produced by Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This week's episode was written by Hannah Tyler, Teresa Cardinal-Brown, and Hanadi Jordan. Ethan Plotkin produces and edits our show. The executive producer of BPC Podcasts is Lucy Manning. See you next time on This Week in Immigration.